Thanks. Why don't you grab your seats? Let's just roll with this. Man, thanks. I know yesterday I just kind of cracked. I said to, to James, I feel like I cracked a can open and just went pop for a while. And I'm not used to an hour time frame, so I was challenged a little by that because uh, I felt like we were just going. But I want to pick up and just build on where we were. And, and I just want to uh, nutshell a couple things this morning. Listen, we have to understand that Jesus is, he's not just our savior, he's not our atonement, or our sin sacrifice, he's not just those things. He's actually our model for life. Like, Jesus is our model for life. He, he said to learn of me, right? He said to follow me. He said, call no one on earth your teacher. You have one teacher, that's pretty narrow. You have one teacher. Come on, I've been taught by a lot of things through my life. I've been taught by sheer instinct in the fall of man that if you do me wrong, I get hurt, frustrated, insecure, or something that doesn't produce life. I've been taught that by life, right? But not the giver of it. Are you following me? So I want to look to Jesus. I want to learn from him. I want to look at Jesus' life and see how he responded to injustice, see how he responded to people that didn't appreciate him or see who he was or people that did him wrong. His own disciples, who he invested into and sowed into, man, when he was struck, they scattered, but a minute ago, they said they'll die for him, but none of them did. Come on, that's a hurting pastor in today's society. That's a person that needs to break away and heal. And Jesus doesn't even know how to break or get hurt. I want to learn from that. If he said, follow me, there's something about Jesus that I can live in. Because he said, as the Father sent me in John 20, as the Father sent me, so I send you. In 1 John 4, he said, as he is, so are we in the world. In the whole chapter, he talks about him being love. See, love doesn't seek its own. Love seeks the highest uh, sake of another, the highest profit of another. Love lays down its life for another. Well, if love lays down its life for another, what are, we gonna, what are we doing offended? What are we doing hurt, taken back, discouraged, disappointed? There's something we got to understand about this gospel that we really got to get. Or we have these burning hearts to touch the world, evangelize, and get people to believe our doctrine, but not let our doctrine make us new. Come on, this is not about going to heaven. This is about heaven coming back into us. The kingdom of God's here. It's on the earth. It's at hand, and I'm looking at it. You don't look here. You don't look there. It's in you. The kingdom of God's in you. So you and I, we've been living off this old wine of just the way that seemeth right to a man, the perspective of the world, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of this age, the basic principles of life. Come on. Every one of us was trained and homeschooled in the wrong home. We were. And it's time to get new life through Jesus Christ. And that's not just positional, guys. Come on. How's my light going to shine if it's just positional? How am I going to walk in a manner worthy if it's just positional? How's my life going to have impact if it's just positional? These aren't positional phrases in Scripture. They're absolute realities, and my life becomes something because of Him. You know, we've gotten tricked into a self-serving gospel. We've gotten tricked into a gospel that blesses me, benefits me, provides for me, and helps me make it to the end. So my whole goal is making it. My goal is becoming like Him. Come on. I'm not trying to survive. Are you kidding me? I'm never going to die. Seriously, I'm not saying that in an arrogant, hype way. I'm never going to die. I know that. I am going to be alive forever because I'm one with the eternal one. So I already won. I'm not trying to win. I already won. Now I just want to make full use of the moment I'm in, this little window, this gift that you all have called life. It's a gift. It's not a dread. The only reason it feels like a grind to people is because they're living it outside of why they're here. Why would grace come on you to drive drive down a road you weren't called to travel? People say, life's a this, life's a that, life's a bleep, life's a blank. No, life's a gift. It's been given by God Almighty. It was you that went into that egg. It was you that came out of that womb. You say, well, my mother never loved me, but God left you have life. You say, well, my dad wasn't there for me. Call no man on earth your father. You have one father. He's in heaven. See, let's get our eyes off these earthly things and let's start thinking a little different. Your life's here because God said so. You say, well, I was conceived in rape. I was conceived in fornication. My, my mom was drunk. She didn't even love the man. You're here, aren't you? If there's a time to be born, bam, here you are. Don't you find your identity through what was on this earth. Find your identity through what was was from the beginning. Come on. Everybody in this room 
has life through Jesus Christ if they believe on him. Everybody's on purpose. Everybody's the will of God. If you have life, it's because God said so. Right? Now you got to repent and you got to come into him and in through him to walk in what you're here for. But everybody has an open door where God's concerned. I don't preach this thing, everybody's all okay. No, no, some of us got to get out of the wrong believing. Some of us got to get out of the things that are stealing away and stripping. It's time for change. Come out of darkness into light. That's not works and legalism. There's a thing I see I'm created for, and everything that doesn't fit that doesn't belong. Like, honestly, you don't know me really. You just meet me, and I know I seem a little excited. I try to calm down so I can communicate. I, I am. I'm being, I'm being just to you. I am way more excited in my heart than you see. Because I'm serious. Like, I don't know how to not be okay. Because I didn't wake up for anybody to do anything for me today. I didn't wake up for one thing to go right. I don't have a long prayer list of suggestions and things to God to make my day better. My day's amazing. I woke up and he's inside me. And I understand why. I'm not here for you to do anything for me. I'm here to love you. That makes it pretty simple. You can't break my heart now. You can't hurt me. You can't let me down. I didn't put my expectation on you. My expectation's from the Lord. Oh, I'm having the time of my life for 23 years. I'm either in the longest, most incredible dream any man's ever dreamed, or this is real. So if I'm in a dream, don't wake me up. I'm having too much fun. Look, it'd be one thing to put on a jacket and try to impress you and act this thing out and stand here and be all this and try to impress you. The truth is I'm impressed with somebody that loved me when I was unlovely. Somebody that on my darkest day didn't lose sight of why I'm here and what I'm created for. Why? Because he's not personal and self-centered and self-focused. He's love. And he's my father. Yeah? And I'm glad and proud to be his son. Yeah? I'm just not going to fight that. <laughs> and I'm not going to let any devil talk me out of it. Jesus shed his blood to redeem my life. Yay. And I'm saying, okay, I'm yours. So when I say I'm yours, I deny myself. So I realize, man, I'm done living for me. Watch this. I'm not even a Christian for me. Do you know how many people are Christians for themselves, for their gain, for their future? Do you know how many people become Christians so they go to heaven and don't go to hell? That's why life feels like hell. Because you're not a Christian for the reason he came. He came to transform you. He came to put his life inside of you. He came to put his heart and his nature inside of you. And I'm going to talk to you. I really am. I know I'm going to get to it. You'll say, well, I wish you'd get to it. I'm going to talk to you about how easy it is to begin to walk this thing out. Listen, on the night I got saved, I hadn't been to church for a long, long time. I quit going to church when I was between 18 and 20. By 20, it was official. I never went back. And, and, and I, just, I, I was just a Christian because it was right. And mom took me to church. And he died on the cross to forgive my sin. And I had to confess that I was a sinner and believe that. So when he comes, because he's coming, you want to go to heaven. That was all I knew growing up. Well, that, there was nothing about that that had the power to change my life. It just was always about heaven or hell. Are you for him? As, 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 and that usually meant, are you going to church or aren't you? But I was still just as angry. I was still just as frustrated. I still had the same desires that every young man ends up facing. I quoted the quotes and prayed the prayer. When I was 12, they baptized me. But all I knew was he died on the cross to forgive my sins. No, no, no. He died on the cross to redeem my life, to restore truth back into me, to put his image in me and to get me back to the beginning as if sin never happened. Yeah? yeah. And then he's going to rule this kingdom with a scepter of righteousness and through his blood cause me to stand right before God every day of my life. And all of a sudden I'm not striving for perfection. He completed me. And all of a sudden, this thing is great. And if you don't start where he finished, you'll never run well. Oh, man, it's the gospel. It's liberating. I said to James, I said, it's good tidings of great joy. Well, where's the great joy in our lives? We don't understand the good tidings. We're finding our identity through ministry, through our gifting, through our calling, through our friendships, through what we're a part of instead of who's in us. That's why we're let down by the things that we're trying to find ourselves through. That's why we're hurt. That's why people are discouraged. Be honest with me. 
If you're discouraged, where's your focus? Yourself and how things are affecting you and what it's putting in you in the middle of and how this is going to cost you. And, and I thought you denied yourself for the sake of the kingdom. I thought we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I thought we love not our own lives unto death. I thought. Maybe we haven't heard the gospel this way. I get countless people say, man, I've never heard the gospel the way you're preaching. And I'm thinking, why? It's been this way from the beginning. It's all through the book. Wonder if this self-centered twist somehow snuck in and Christianity has become more about us than him. More about him taking care of us, protecting us, keeping us, providing for us, instead of us shining. Paul understood. He said, whether I have enough or don't, it's the same. I got it. And I don't change. Whether I have what I need or have what I don't need or don't have what I need, I don't change. Holy Spirit tells me everywhere I go, chains and prisons await me there. But you know what? None of these things are moving me because I don't count my own life dear, man. I'm going to fulfill the reason he's inside of me. That was Paul. He didn't always understand that. There was a time that he was asking the Lord to take the buffeting away, take the persecution away. Every time I opened my mouth, stones and chains and whips and rods. Jesus said, look, I told you the things you're going to suffer for my name's sake. I already let you know that. My grace is going to get you through. You just keep preaching my gospel. Stop loving your own life. Go after this thing. I'll tell you, you living for you and me living for me is the biggest dysfunction that's happening on the planet. It's why life is so tough. And we're so needy in that realm. Be honest to me, with me, people. In that realm, you are so needy. Your life is dependent on everybody else and them doing what you need. Well, if Jesus lived that way on the earth, he's in trouble. Jesus wouldn't have made it one day. People are so fickle in that. Like, like he comes from the wilderness and he opens the scroll in Luke 4 and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That had to be a good day. Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he's speaking, and the people are going, and says every eye is fixed on him. It's Luke 4. It's right there. You can check it out. I'm telling you the truth. I'm just saving a little time. If you need me to go right to every scripture, I will. I just won't get as much accomplished. I'm letting you know where it is. It's Luke 4. It's right there. He took the scroll. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Every eye is fixed on him. They're thinking, who is this dude? Whoa. A little different than the Pharisees. Wow, this guy's got authority. Man, I'm feeling something right here, dude. After a bit, they go, hey, he's talking about us. Is he talking about us? He is talking about us. Kill him. <laughs> a couple verses ago, they're like, whoa, who's this guy? Man, look at the authority. Wow. A couple verses later, personal, offended. He's talking about us. He's preaching at us. Well, I don't want nobody preaching to me. Let's push him off the cliff. You guys are at CFNI, man. If that's your debut preaching, and you had them captivated for about two minutes, and then they realized you were pe preaching at them to help adjust something or change or increase something in their life, and they took it personal, and they shouted you off the stage or threw things at you, or somebody actually tried to push you off a cliff, you're probably not ready to just jump right back in the saddle, and you're probably debriefing and wondering where you went wrong. When your motive's pure, you're, you're pretty free. When nobody owes you anything, it makes you pretty untouchable. Like on the night Jesus was betrayed. On the night he was what? Don't think your Bible doesn't say that on purpose. He's teaching us. On the night he was betrayed, his idea of responding was lay down his life. Guess who helped betray him? his own men that he invested into for years. But when he rose from the dead, he called them brother and not backstabbing two-faced whatevers. Wow. Yeah. Why? Because he's Jesus? Because he's love. Yeah. Don't make him a special man or you can't attain to what he called you to. Don't say because he's Jesus. That's religion. It's because he's love. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction the purpose of the commandment is love. If you don't have love, you have nothing. If we miss love, we've missed the whole point of why he came. He didn't come so you're loved by God. He came so you and I become the love of God. <laughs> I 
On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and he passed the cup and gave his life. We got to make sure on the night we're betrayed, we're not crying, calling a friend and asking for prayer. Wondering why if we're in covenant and have favor with God, he allowed them to do this to me. And getting totally confused and deceived in our relationship with the Lord and somehow we think he's our survival kit instead of our answer for a new life. Are you with me? Yes. Come on, guys. Are you with me? Because yes. I'm telling you, we can live this way. It's not unreachable or he wouldn't call you to it. It takes faith and grace. And those things are both available because everyone has the measure of faith and he's the God of all grace. So I think we're okay. Yay. <laughs> so your good fight, what's your good fight? What's the good fight you're in? The good fight of what? So your fight is believing this truth in the face of every challenge, believing this truth in the face of life itself. Your fight is not against the devil, and it's certainly not people, because your war is not flesh and blood. Your good fight is staying in the truth where you're free in the face of everything, so you shine through everything. Look, if we go to church for the rest of our lives, get thrown into crisis, and respond like the man that never went to church, we've missed something. If we're broken like they're broken, we have missed something. If we fret like they fret, we've missed something. Come on, what good would it do to go to church for the next 35 years, serve in a ministry, never miss a Sunday, and even pay your tithe every week? Get thrown into crisis and respond like the man that doesn't even believe in God. Then we've been sold by religion, and we're not for sale. I'm called to shine a light come hell or high water, it doesn't say when things are good. I'm called to shine. Let your light so shine. Arise, shine, church. Your light has come. Yeah? So wonder if Christianity is as simple as letting the truth change your perspective and waking up with a different why, a different reason for being. I wonder if Christianity is just getting your motive, your motive aligned to truth and it's the single eye that brings light to all your body. I wonder if you have this man, he gets laid off at work and he's a good church guy. He's an elder in his church. He actually goes to board meetings and he helps make decisions and he leads on Saturday men's prayer. I'm not being facetious, I'm being real. So say this guy has all these titles and functions and he's a regular at church. He's known in the community. He just got laid off from his job, didn't see it coming. Falling apart, fretting, oh my gosh, I gotta pray. He's calling prayer change. He's all weeping in his car. God, I can't believe you let this happen to me. How am I gonna pay my bills? God, you gotta do something. He calls his wife, she falls apart. They're calling all their friends to pray, pray, pray. That's a normal Christian scenario. Breaks my heart that we actually think that's Christian. All of a sudden, all you do is just become what you're going through. Instead of become what he went through, so you can respond in every situation like he does. Come on, we, let's not ever be reduced. See, the reason I'm talking like this so strong, especially here, is because if you're studying up and you get called into something and you're going to a nation, you're going to a mission field, you got a ministry working and you got CFNI in your background and you got all this teaching and training and don't understand this thing, you will get wiped out in time. People will get on your nerves. People will hurt you. You'll wonder why it ain't working and I thought I was called and you'll question and second guess and think this is Christian. Find your identity through your calling. Find your identity through your ministry. Find your identity through your anointing. Dangerous, tragic. Don't ever do that, people. You find your identity through the Son of God. You find your identity through right standing with the Father. You find your identity through acceptance and righteousness. Clean and holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. If indeed you keep believing that and don't let anything change your mind. Colossians 1. Yeah? Can you hear that everything I'm telling you has scripture wrapped all around it? Your identity is in him. Ministry is something you do. The identity is something you become. You live out of your being, and then all you're doing is healthy. And it'll stand the test of time. You know why I'm so passionate and confident? The gospel taught me one thing. To wake up every day and know that nobody owes me a thing. You're not going to get on my nerves. I have new ones. 
I'm serious. Do you know what happened to me this morning? My phone rang in my, in my bedroom at five in the morning, which isn't a problem. I'm usually up really early. I don't actually sleep that much. I'm pretty alive. <laughs> it's hard to sleep a long time for me. <laughs> when my phone rang at five, it was my wife. She was a little distraught. There was a lady pounding on my door at my house at that hour in the morning, desperate and desolate, tracked me down through YouTube and found my address and was coming, believing it was faith in God. And, and my wife was a little unsettled. She didn't know the lady. And the lady's threatening suicide and she can't bear it and she can't go on. And I watched your husband on YouTube, please. She said, he's not here. He's out of town. Oh. I said, honey, I'll call the home phone, hand her the phone. I got nothing but love for that lady. Do I encourage her to do it that way? Should she have done it that way? Do I need people knocking on my door at four and five in the morning? No, I don't think that's the answer. I think we're so ministry minded. We, we're ministry crazed. We think we need ministry. We, we need truth and relationship. We need to know him. I never read a scripture that says ministry makes you free. If you don't stop believing the same things that are causing the problems, you'll never see change. I don't care how much you get prayed for. It's just true, guys. If, if, if you don't let the gospel change the way you think, how will your being ever change? Look, you're not conformed to the world. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look that up. It means thinking like you've never thought before. By the renewing of your mind so you can prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. He's invited you into his world, his kingdom, his realm. He said, I don't call you servants. I call you friends because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. We're supposed to know the heart of the Father in all this. But you know what, what, what touched the lady the most on the phone? About halfway through the conversation, she began to cry and weep and say, you have done nothing but love me and show patience and kindness on this phone. I said, that's because I know who you are. I said, that's not even a challenge for me, honey. It's not about, oh, are you kidding me? This woman knocking on our door at five? She's crazy. What is she doing? How out of order? She needs to get a grip. See, I know who she is. On your darkest day, God didn't lose sight of who you are. On her darkest day, she needs Christ too. She doesn't need a frustrated preacher that travels the country and finds his identity in the pulpit. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I don't try to live this way. Never once did I try. It's what I believe. I'm not trying to be a Christian. I'm not even trying to do right. I'm enjoying being loved by him. Yeah. I wake up accepted and received. I don't try to please him. He's pleased to love me. That's amazing. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Come on. Come on. If, if, if I'd do a survey, you'd be amazed if you were honest how many hands would go up if I'd say, how many of you have woken up and tried to do right, do better, and not sin and stuff like that? You'd be amazed how many people would raise their hand if they were honest. You don't ever live that way. That, that produces condemnation. It puts you in a test on your own test every day. That, that you'll always be aware of what's wrong. You'll never understand the growth and increase in maturity in your life. You'll always be nitpicking. You'll learn to be critical against your own self. You won't even have a good view of yourself in time. And, and if you don't see yourself clear, you won't see worthy of being in his presence. So you won't have intimacy. If you don't have intimacy, you'll never get pregnant. And you'll never reproduce. Are you guys okay? <laughs> I'm not like freaking you out, right? Come on. If, if, if you wake up and try not to sin, you'll be sin conscious. wonder if you wake up and enjoy being his. I wonder if you just wake up in the morning and say, Father, thank you for today instead of God, I hope you get me through today. Come on. Two scenarios. Remember the man laid off? Remember the man laid off crying, prayer chains? wonder if that same man gets that layoff thing and goes, wow, I never saw this coming. Lord, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't know you. I'd probably be a mess. I so appreciate covenant. I so appreciate your love for me and my family. You know my bills, my situation. I don't need to plead and supplicate and cry out all this stuff. The truth is you're for me and not against me. I don't even understand this. I don't know where I'm going to go from here. 
but I know it's going to work out. You'll give me wisdom. I'll knock on some doors. Somebody will show interest. I'll find favor. I just thank you that my life is in your hand and my family and our well-being. God, you are so good. But the truth is we're going to shine through every step of this. Why isn't that normal? Why do you become laid off instead of a son? Why do you become cheated on instead of found favor? Why do you become done wrong instead of done right? Why do we let what one man says and one man does decide our life when his name's not Jesus? And then go to church and sing, He's Lord, and let everything else govern our life, disposition, and well-being. Come on, I'm just here. I'm not playing games with this. I'm as serious as I can be, man. But you can tell I'm not overbearing. I'm not mean. I'm not harsh. I'm having the time of my life. And I want you to have the time of your life. This thing is true, and the just shall live by So you got to believe this thing and realize we were brought up in a lie. We were raised in a lie, and now the truth's come. So we come out of the darkness into the light. We come out of the darkness into the light. You get what it means? You were brought up in the lie, trained by a lie your whole life. And then the truth came. And we beheld him in grace and truth. He shot out a dry ground. And we beheld him and he dwelt among us. Woo! (laughs) And And I promise you, he's not just my suffering savior. He's not my forgiveness of sins. He's my friend. He's my king. He's my Lord. He's my model for life. He's amazing. He shows me how to live. Yeah? He says, follow me. What an invite. (laughs) Matthew 16, if any man come after me, let him acknowledge that he sinned, pray a prayer, and get his name written in a book called life. Look, I'm not against your name in the book called life. I want it there. I'm not against living forever. I think that's incredible. I'm against making that the goal of Christianity. The goal of Christianity is not you going to heaven someday. The goal of Christianity is your transformation. Yeah? Yeah. Watch this. He says you're either for me or either gathered to me or you. You can totally see your need for a Savior. You can totally be sincere about forgiveness and pray for him to forgive you of your sins and actually weep in godly sorrow for the, for the removal of your sins and have attitudes, mindsets, and beliefs that are totally detrimental to what he wants to do in your life, through your life, and around your life. And your mindsets and your attitudes and your thoughts can actually work against his kingdom even though you're a part of it. Ain't that something? You're either for him or... I love that. Don't you love that, that there's no middle ground? He takes away the middle ground. You're either either thinking in a way that's productive and for him or thinking in a way that's putting pressure, working against everything he's trying to accomplish. I know people that God says through his word and through his son crucified. This young lady just did phenomenal. She said, man, I want the love that looks like a cross. And God, there's no better example than that cross. And I'm like, yay. She's that's that's like, that's my language. I, I, I get that. Because the measuring stick of God's love for me is Christ crucified, not my circumstances. How many Christians say, man, I thought God loved me. Well, I don't know where God's love is in this. Well, I don't know. I wonder if God even loves me. And they're trying to find love through life instead of the giver of it. If you don't settle on love being through the cross, how could you ever get rooted and grounded in it? And if faith works through love and you're not established in the love God has for you, how's faith ever going to work clean? You'll just be driven by need all the time and call it prayer. You'll turn this book into a bunch of principles that we're trying to apply, hoping they work, instead of an introduction into covenant and love and oneness and unity. Are you with me? Okay. That clock keeps ticking, so I'm going to try to go here to get some scripture accomplished. Did we laugh? Are you guys... Are you guys clear with where I'm at right here and what the whole point of the cross is? The whole point of the cross is you and me becoming love and being restored back to the very image of God. And it's possible because of the same spirit that raised him from the dead living in us. Yeah? Would Jesus ask you to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him if you couldn't? Do you think he's sitting up there laughing like a hyena going, look, they're actually trying it. They think I was serious. 
<laughs> Denying yourself is the biggest deal. And it's not legalistic. It's not rigid. It's not, it's, it's realizing, oh my goodness. It's all about his kingdom and the highest sake of others. And the way he loved me when I was unlovely, I'm not regarding any man, 2 Corinthians 5, according to the flesh. I'm going to see men for what they're created for, their value and their purpose. I'm not going to see men for what they're producing. I'm going to see men what they're here for. And I'm never going to throw anybody away again because he didn't throw me away. I'm not judging anybody again because he didn't judge me, except in righteousness. So I'm going to see men for the truth, not what they appear to be. Come on, it's 2 Corinthians 5. Paul said, it's the love of Christ that compels us. It's the love of Christ. I love what this young lady said. She said, not a Hollywood love. Man, isn't that something? Just that steamy, starry-eyed, ooh. Oh, he likes me. Ooh. No, that's called insecurity, identity crisis, and you're going to get burned. It's cheap, and that means you're for sale, and you're not for sale. Stop. Just stop. Hello? Oh, but I just love her. I just love him. Oh, I don't know what I'd do without him. There's only one that deserves that description. Hello? I, t I explained it yesterday. We were all born into this loss of identity. We were born into Adam, guys. You were born into Adam, cut off from the source of love. Even though love loves you, you're cut off from it. You're separated from it. And your identity is wrapped up in you. And when we're born, we don't know who we are. So we're trying to find ourselves along the way. And at a very young age, you're nothing more than a product of how you responded to how it went down. And most people don't do well. Very insecure, very low esteemed. Very messed up identities. Look in the mirror and hate who they are. So they need people to like them to prove they're likable because they don't like themselves. And the problem with that is you're to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind and love your neighbor as your... So if you don't see yourself clear, how do you see others clear? So how can you love your neighbor as yourself if you don't even love yourself? If you're insecure, if you have a low esteem, if you have a twisted identity, if you're still needy, if you're in a ministry like this just looking for attention... Make sure that's never the case. And if that is the case, stop it right now and say, wait a minute, that is twisted. Man, I've been insecure. I've been riding my gifting. I've been looking to be noticed. I've been waiting for my chance. I got my chance a long time ago when he moved inside of me. I got nothing to prove. I have the joy of becoming. I don't need to be accepted. I am. And that's going to put solidity in your life and your expression will be solid. Yeah? Yeah? And your heart will be done getting broken. One of the biggest things that grieves my heart in the body of Christ is even a lot of us leaders get tricked into our own experiences and we're following one another in life's pattern instead of him. Because if you can't see it in his life, why is it okay in ours? If he called us to follow him, why is it okay? Why do we say, well, everybody's going to be disappointed, brother. Everybody's going to get discouraged at times. You'll never hear me preaching that. I don't believe we have to be that way. I believe we can grow up into him in all things to the full measure of the stature of who he is. Amen. It says, consider him, Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself, lest you be weary and discouraged in your own souls. What's he saying? Discouragement's never heaven. Now, if all your motivation is your ministry, your calling, your destiny, your future, you'll probably bump into raw discouragement. But if it's all about love and loving others and laying down your life and not loving yourself, you'll probably do just fine. <laughs> Look, whatever I appear to you, probably a little flaky, I don't know, but whatever I appear to you, do you think I'm this way because everything's always going great for me and everybody's doing perfect and all my little ducks are in a row? Your ducks are never in a row. Stop even believing for that. It's like, because it means nothing. It means nothing. You don't need people to do the right things for you to be right. He did the right thing. You've been made right in him. Come on, when Jesus raised from the dead, it's not a joke. He said to Mary, go tell my brethren. That would have been tough if he just said, you go tell them low life, weak willed. Say one thing, do another no account disciples of mine that I got to talk to them soon. No, instead he walked in the room, 
while they're in there in fear, huddled in fear, read it, John 20, they're huddled in fear. They're not having a prayer meeting, guys. They're afraid it's going to happen to them next. And he walks in the room through the wall, apparently. And he says, peace to you. Why? He just made peace through his blood. He just took his blood to the heavenlies. And Hebrews 9 it, man. He just took it. He said, Mary, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. He was so excited to take his own blood into heaven and put it on the mercy seat and be a priest between God and man. Where sin can no longer have dominion over you. The law, the spirit of life in Christ make you free from the law of sin and death. Yeah, where Christ in you, the hope of glory could manifest. Yeah, he said, peace to you. And they're all looking at him. And he shows them his hands, his side, and they touched and felt and went, woo, and they were happy and glad that it was the Lord. And the very next thing out of his mouth when they realized, it's the Lord. The second thing, or the very next thing out of his mouth, the second time he said it, but it's a different piece. He said, peace to you the second time, right in John 20. It's right there in your Bible. You can look at it right now while I'm talking. End of the chapter, verse 20, 21, right in there. He says, peace to you the second time. What's he do that for? Why does he say peace to you the second time? Because he knows as soon as they realized it's him, what's the first thing that bombarded their conscience? How they betrayed him, how they ran, how they were cowards, how they denied him, how they loved their own life when they sat at supper with him and said they'd all die for him. He's standing in front of them, and they go, it's you. And the first thing that hits them is, man, we ran. And he said, peace to you. Oh! <gasps> So what's he saying by calling them brethren and saying peace to you? He's saying, I haven't changed my mind about one of you. I haven't changed my mind about any of you. I know what you're capable of. I know your purpose, your potential, your destiny. And I just paid a price and opened the door. Now you guys got to get with it and live by faith. Now would you go into the nations and rock those nations and make believers of all men? Get out of here and go do it. Yeah? Well, actually he told them to wait in the city until the Holy Ghost comes on them. But he told them to go after he comes, right? I got a little excited. We're ready to go. Just get in the car and go, man. Just go. Just go. <laughs> I got a little excited. But, but they had to wait for the empower of the Holy Spirit to become a witness. But he didn't say, you need boot camp. You need another semester. What he said is, guys, it's time to believe me. And it's time to believe how I see you. You're lacking nothing. Now believe it. And when Holy Ghost comes, you are definitely ready. Go change the world. You know what he says right after that? If you forgive the sins of any, they'll be forgiven. But if you retain the sins, they'll be retained. What's he talking about? Because you don't have permission to retain sins. There's nowhere in Scripture that tells you to live in unforgiveness. Or to judge a book by the cover. Is there anywhere in Scripture that tells you that retaining sins is cool? Then why does it sound like he's giving them an option? He's not. Here's what he's saying. If you go out and love them like I've just loved you, in the midst of all their weakness and all their backwards and all their say one thing and do another, if you go and love men like I've loved you, surely they'll know the way to me and know my love and forgiveness. But if you let your hearts get hard, shut up your heart, and fail to walk in the love that I've loved you in, how will men know the way to forgiveness? Why? Because you're the body of Christ. You don't work for him. You're his expression. You're his body, not his employee. Oh, your sons and daughters. And he paid a price to put himself in you. So what was the cross all about? Was the cross really about sin? is about restoring purpose and value and destiny. See, the cross speaks more about our value than our sin. He had to die to remove our sin. I get it, and it's scriptural. But he didn't die because we're sinners. He died because we were lost sons and there's a higher truth to walk in. Nobody pays a high price for nothing unless they believe the purchased possession is worth the price. So he shed the blood of his own son to show what he thinks of the purchased possession. Many sons. (laughs) my whole life I was taught that he died on the cross because I'm a sinner and we go at it from the depravity of man and try to get man to change and feel sorry for his depravity instead of be transformed by his goodness it's the goodness of God that leads men to change not the reprimand unschooled and unlearned and misunderstanding talking how to turn people say well it ain't all about the love of God it's about the judgment too and then they quote Old Testament scriptures under the law 
You can't show me one scripture that tells me it's the judgment of God that transforms a life. But I can show you it's the goodness of God that does. For God so loved that he gave. It doesn't say for God was at so wit's ends and so frustrated and so mad at humanity, he finally sent his son. He loved you. On your darkest day, honey, on your biggest struggle, in a season where your identity was struggling and you didn't feel good about yourself and you made bad choices, stuff like that, he says, I love you. I know who you are, girl. And I'm wooing you to my presence, to my love, and to my kingdom. And better yet, I'm going to put myself in you and you're going to shine. Yeah? That's exactly what he says. And he calls you out of darkness and puts you into the light. You get it? It's called born again. And it's not a prayer to go to heaven. How we ever bought into that, I'll never be quite sure. It's the transformation of life. You don't put new wine in an old wineskin. The wineskin becomes new so it can hold the wine. <laughs> Are you guys all right? Yesterday, I felt like I opened a can of worms. Today, I feel like I'm actually preaching really good right now. I just do. I just feel happy in my heart. <laughs> But I want to show you a scripture, and I want to show you how easy it is to walk this out, okay? Go to Colossians chapter 3 with me, please. There's so many scriptures I could read right now. That John 21 just wrecks me, guys. Like, do you know that when he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you? Do you know he said that in John 20? When he walked in and said, peace be unto you the second time, then he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Watch, up until then, these guys didn't do one thing right. And they're still his choice, and he's still sending them. Guess what he did right after he said, as the Father sent me, I send you. Guess what he did? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You guys know that's in John 20? He breathed on them and said, receive Holy Spirit. That's not some charismatic, he's not having an order call, he's not like, fill, 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 fill. Look, why did he breathe on them? Why didn't he just say, receive the Holy Spirit? He holds all things together by the word of his power. I mean, he's the Lord. It's by him that all things exist. He could have said, receive Holy Spirit. He's the redemption of man. He, redemption means brought back, bought back to original value. He redeemed man back to the beginning. How did God make man a living being in the beginning? What happened when Adam ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He died. So Jesus is the second breath of God to man. He's the last Adam. He's the restoration of life. So what did Jesus do through his blood? Now that his blood's speaking better things, he comes into the room and says, hey, peace to you guys. It's a wrap. As the Father sent me, so I send. That makes us one. That means same. As the Father sent me, I send. And then he goes, why? Because through his blood, they're being born again, and they become living beings again. And he takes them back to day one as if the day God breathed into Adam, as if sin never happened because of the power of his blood. Oh! And you think I'm going to spend one minute thinking about sin. I'm thinking about righteousness. I'm thinking about the kingdom. I'm thinking about the love of God. I'm thinking about holiness and righteousness. Not trying to attain to those things, walking in the things he attained. And all of a sudden, if I'm righteous conscious, it produces its fruit to holiness without me trying to be holy. Yay, then all glory goes to God, and I am what I am by the grace of God, and I bet he gets all the honor. And I'm just a believer. I'm not a super Christian, a hero, a great Christian. I'm a believer. And I think that's what you are. That's why you're here. I'm talking to a whole room of believers. So let's just keep believing the right things and let the right fruit be all over this tree. Yeah? He's amazing. I'm a believer. He's righteous. I believe it. Yeah? He loves me. I believe it. Your fight is the good fight of faith. 
you got to believe what he says and what he accomplished in the midst of being trained otherwise by life itself. And we got to go back to the giver of it to find truth because in him is freedom. Are you with me? Okay. So that's why he breathed into his disciples because he's taken them back to the garden and it was day one as if nothing happened in between and the tree's still there and the serpent is still whispering in our lives and the knowledge of good and evil is still there, guys. Follow him. You're clean. You're sanctified. He's in us. Follow him. Oh yeah, yak, yak, yak. Follow him. Yeah, but shh. Follow him. But you don't know what I've been through. Shh. What about what he's been through? Follow him. But you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. Shh. Stop finding your identity through things that aren't him. Look, if we have to be so sensitive to all of our stories, we're going to go through this room and find out who's been through the most hell and then what? Then turn up the instruments and sing it's all about heaven? I'm confused. Look, I'm sorry that we've walked in darkness. I'm sorry people close to you and that you trusted broke your heart and did things wrong, but God's teaching you how not to be broken. I think we just think we get broke, he heals. He get broke, he heals. I wonder if he teaches you how not to be broken. I wonder if that's what it means when he says he heals the brokenhearted. He puts a heart in me that's indestructible now, and I guard it because out of it flows the issues of life. Wow. You with me? Okay, for the third, fourth time, I'm going to try to get here quick. I'm really running close now, but I got a whole nother day tomorrow. But no, and I'm honored by that, but I'm not sure you're so confident I'll get finished with this by tomorrow. (laughs) But I know one thing. I'm not talking in riddles and you can hear plain what I've been saying. And there ain't nobody in this room. See, I've said to the Lord, and this would be good advice for you in ministry down the road and you start growing in this and that. This would be just, just, I don't really use this phrase, but this would be healthy advice. Whenever you speak in front of people, you have no need to preach. You're not finding your identity through preaching. You have something to say because you've been with him. A long time ago, the Lord told me, don't ever read your Bible to preach a sermon. He said, only read your Bible to know me. And only ever preach out of who I am in your life. He said, that's what will carry revelation and mark hearts and bring change. Don't just discourse and throw out theology and doctrine. Don't don't read your Bible to be doctrinal. Read your Bible to be changed. And speak out of that change. The Lord told me that a long time ago. This is what Holy Spirit had me do. He had me start praying this a long time ago. I'm standing over there and I kneel during worship. You guys just did a little opening song, which is awesome. This young lady got up and prayed and it was beautiful and I paid attention and it was all good. I was in the moment, right? But I slip on my knees and here's what I do. What an honor to be here, all these students. God, this is humbling. This is amazing. You know I have no need to be here. I'm not finding my identity out of this. I am just honored. If anything I say helps in power and parts, man, so be it. But Lord, I'm gonna step up there. They're gonna turn on this mic in a minute. God, if they handed you a mic in a minute, and you stood there and faced this room, you know the room, what would you say? Let those be the only words that come out of my mouth. So I'm personally, I'm not telling you to do this, and some of your leaders are sitting here, so don't get nervous with me. I personally don't prepare for a thing. My preparation is my relationship. And you'd be amazed what I'm prepared to teach right now if you'd ask me. (laughs) Because I've been with him. (laughs) You get what I'm saying? But this heart cry that's coming out of me, I feel like I got this one little shot at you guys, you know. I'm honored to stand in front of you. I really am. And I got this one little crack at just influencing something in your life. And and I feel like, wow, God, say what you would say. And I think I'm feeling the passion of that, the excitement of that, the intensity of that, the seriousness of that. And yet it's not overwhelming. It's not condemning you. It's, right? And that's just a good thing. So when you're speaking, always ask him to say through you exactly what he'd say if he had the mic. And I know that sounds like a religious kind of prayer, like, well, of course you'd pray that. No, no, you're praying that relationally, and you so mean it, because you have no need to get in front of people and preach. I have no need. I I preach with my life everywhere I go. My life, I preach to a tree. I just, just, dude, you're amazing. Look at you. You're, 
Your bark is so unique. I would wave my branches too if I were you. Worship him, man. Worship him. I just, I'm just telling you. I just, I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to be free. And I'm not going to let life decide how I'm doing. I'm going to let who gave me life decide how I'm doing. Okay? So Colossians 3, we're not going to get to <laughs> till tomorrow. But I am going to read it tomorrow. And I'm going to just get right up here and jump right in it. But I, I, I want to do this. I want to back you up a second. Just back you up. And I'm going to close with this. Ephesians 4. Would you back up? It's not too far away. Just a couple steps backwards. Now, don't do that in your life. Just do that today in your Bible. <laughs> he talks about giftings in the body of Christ. Listen, for a long time, we've misunderstood the giftings in the body of Christ. We, we recognize an anointing, we put them on a platform, call it a conference, and expect that anointing to minister to everybody instead of train, equip, and empower, and let the grace on their life be the grace in our lives. Like, you might not all be a prophet, but you can all walk in a faucet of prophecy. You can all have a word for your coworker, for your friend, or a person down the street. You might not walk in the office of a prophet, but through the office of the prophet, you can receive an impartation of a grace to prophesy. You get what I'm saying? Okay, you guys get that. So the whole goal of the gifting isn't to build a conference around so that gifting ministered us and we all get a word and we're all pulling on the Lord for a word. Like today, what's the ministry today? It's the ministry of the word. It's the truth that makes us free. It's God convicting in us with a word in our hearts that we can become that we're called to. You don't need any other word right now. You see what I'm saying? So the highest anointing that I'm walking in right now is an impartation of truth that can bring freedom to your life if you say yes. You get it? It's not always about just hands laid on. I'm not against that. I love the way God moves. But I think we get ministry driven. We're looking for feelings, encounters. I want relationship. I want to know him. Because eternal life is knowing him. I want to lay on my bed when nobody's looking. And know that I have access to him and he's right there and actually believe that. I want to know him. I don't want to experience him. I want to know him. Because when I know him, I promise you I've experienced him. Are you getting that? Okay, don't be a concubine. You know what a concubine is in the Old Testament. They minister to the king and they wait on the king. And they're in the courts of the king and they're around the king. And every once in a while, the king calls their name into his chambers and they brush against his glory for a night. That's a concubine. You're called to be the bride. I'm looking at the queen. You don't serve the Lord and bump into him now and then. <laughs> You're his bride. So let me read this quick, and I know i am got one minute. Ah! I don't do well with time frames. <laughs> I really don't, because I don't know how to land. <laughs> so I stop. It's, you know this, the giftings. It's for the equipping of the saints. Verse 12, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now watch how the gospel talks about life change. I'm just going to read through this, and I'm going to close, and we're going to pray. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Ain't that something? The unity of the faith. One faith. What's that mean? No matter where you live, what you're called to, what your ministry falls at, we all wake up for the same reason. We wake up to shine. We wake up to be like him. Period. That's what makes us one. Look, in all our diversity in this one room, there's no way to walk in one faith unless faith is all living for the same goal, and that's his image. I'll explain it more tomorrow. Watch this. The unity of faith. The knowledge of the Son of God into a complete man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about by wind and doctrine and trickery of men and all that deceitful stuff that's out there and the craftiness. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. And he's Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together, every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the people that don't know God. 
in the futility of their minds, their understandings darkened, they're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them. See, you're not ignorant because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to what they're not here for, right? Lewdness, uncleanness, greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you would put off concerning your former conduct the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on this new man who was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, because this is true, pull away. Uh, put away lying and let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor and we're members of one another. Be angry. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on wrath. Give no place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Watch this. I'm getting somewhere. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Don't grieve, Holy Spirit of God. He is who you're sealed by for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, all wrath, and all anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away. Notice he didn't say manage it. Put it away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has already forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. I'll stop there. Do you see that this gospel calls us, calls us to something? calls us to become something. I've, I've traveled all over the country. People come and they gather and they fill and the place fills up. Now, people know my heart by now that come, that know who I am, that come for the... But a lot of people don't understand anything. Oh, guest speaker, what's he walk in? What follows his life? Is he going to pray for everybody? And they come for what God can do for them instead of how God can make them more like him. If you let that be your everyday motive and wake up to be more like him and wake up believing that nobody owes you a thing and God, I just thank you that you're working something in me that's so amazing that you're causing my life to look more and more like you and I so appreciate what you're doing in my life. If you camp there, and I'm going to nail it tomorrow, I promise, because it's my last time and day and I have to nail it, but I'm just setting it all up and I just cried my heart out today and I'm thankful that you are patient and that you've listened to me. Can you stand to your feet? I'll pray over you guys. And, and there's some gentlemen here, some of your leaders that, that asked me if I'd join them for lunch and want to get to chat and know each other. So if you could kindly just let me slip out with them, I would. You saw yesterday, I don't know if you left or not, but if you stayed, I'm, I'm a patient. I love people. I was here to a little after one just talking to students. And, but today I have a little different schedule. They, they, they got some lunch set up and we're going to go hang out a little bit, okay? So I'm just asking you to honor that. I'm going to make my way out here when we're done. You all ready to pray? Okay. So the biggest deal is that you don't just listen to me pray or, or get used to these corporate settings where somebody just closes out in prayer, but engage your heart. What a good time right now to just be one with him and just acknowledge your heart. And even if you're hearing what I'm saying and you're a yes, just tell him that. Lord, you already know it, but I'm a yes. For my own conscience sake, man, I'm into this thing. I, I want to live this way. I don't want to be hurt and broken and let down and insecure and all the things that I thought was normal. Man, I'm addressing that. I don't think it's normal. Man, I think there's change for me. I think there's new life. I think I can follow you. I'm going after you. I want to live this way, God. You can do that while I'm praying. And I'm telling you, grace is going to come on our lives. So, Father, we just come to you right now, and we just thank you for the glorious gospel that sets men free. It is good tidings of great joy. It is joy unspeakable. It is life and life more abundantly. Everything in your scripture talks about dramatic transformation and change. So, Lord, we recognize today that we grew up and were homeschooled in the wrong home. But we're born again. We're not of the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. And we're not conformed. We're transformed. We're thinking like we've never thought before. And I thank you for many of these. Some of these thoughts in the last two sessions are new thoughts. And they're inspiring thoughts, convicting thoughts, but thoughts that will help us grow. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to mark every heart with this truth. And if anyone in this room would think anything else, I pray that you yourself would bring it to their attention and guide them into this vein of understanding. And Lord God, I thank you that you're the redeemer of time, that time wouldn't slip by, that we don't have to say, well, in five years, I'm still a work in progress. God, I thank you 
that even though we're always growing and maturing, you're doing a work in us now, and you're causing us to see truth now, and you're bringing change now, and our lives are shining now. I just thank you, God, that you're doing this thing. I'm excited about it. I'm glad to be a part of it right in the middle of it, and I'm thankful for all these people in front of me here that have the same heart. So God, bless them. Let your grace rest abundantly above, upon them, and Holy Spirit, I ask you to keep them in this truth in every way. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow at 11. Bye-bye.